Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. It was extremely poignant. It shows that we, all of us here, must continue to fight to save lives. As they said, this couple has a new life here. They've been reborn here, and we must continue such work. So we're going to move on to the third part of this session that of questions. And ask, I'd like to ask you if you have any questions on honor killings and blasphemy. Could you please give your questions to the persons walking around that you see? And I have a first question for Anne-Isabelle Tollet. Would you kindly take the microphone? People are talking about the blasphemy law once again. And someone in the audience wanted to know if this law was only applied in Pakistan or if it was, were to be found in other countries. And if, unfortunately, we were seeing was spreading with the rise of radical Islam. Well, there are five countries that sentence people to death for blasphemy, like uh, in, in Ireland, for example. But of course, it's never actually put into practice. So there's Pakistan, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Sudan. And the case of Asia Bibi, it's important for us to support this cause to show other Muslim countries who might want to Im have a more radical society and impose stricter Sharia, that the international community will not support the blasphemy law. I'm thinking of Egypt. If their first idea could be to include this in the Constitution and to sentence to death to people who are accused of blasphemy, then Asia Bibi should serve a purpose beyond its borders, and it has become a symbol. It's not just a Christian woman who has been sentenced to death for blasphemy. The f cause is to fight against this barbaric law that does not respect human rights. Thank you. We have another question uh, that comes to us through Facebook. And I would like to welcome the admirable work carried out by UN Watch and its Secretary General Hillel Neuer and Ariel Herzog. We are all linked up here from this hall to all the social networks. And I would like to thank them publicly for all their fine work. Uh, thank you. We commend your fine work. So this uh, question that comes to us from Facebook is, today you've been talking about shelters that are temporary shelters for victims of honor crimes. How long do they stay in these shelters, and what happens next? Well, it's clear that one cannot stay in these shelters for a very long time. We have to have training centers so people can learn a trade. We need to have psychologists, social workers to help the young women in these shelters. And if the woman is still endangered when she leaves the shelter and we haven't been able to mediate with the family, well, at that point, we have to see if she can be sent to another country, which also has shelters. Now, another th point that's very important is it, that it's important for us in Europe to be in contact with local organizations in the home country of the women because these local associations work actively on honor crimes. So we can exchange information and see if we can find a solution for the woman. Thank you. 
Another question for Anne-Isabel Tollet. It's a question that challenges about our own practices and our own commitment and presence here. We understood that it hasn't been possible to put in, put in, to condemn it within Pakistan, but condemning it from here, from outside the country, well, won't that make things even more radical within the country? It's a very relevant question. All countries who had to face this problem uh, and who attacked the country for it were attacked in return for interference. Now, he, I'm going to be speaking of the UN. The UN is neutral, as we know, and its work is based on a treaty which Pakistan ratified. Now, under these conditions, Pakistan and its authorities will not be able to say, why are you interfering? All we have to do is to remind them that they have made certain commitments, and either they honor them or they should leave the UN. So I'm in the best place I could be to, uh, to make them face up to this. Well, allow me, I'd like to, after Samin Sarah's uh, testimony, that this has been, uh, has been a hard afternoon for Pakistan. We've heard some very harsh things. Now, I know you'll be leaving us for the UN. I'd like to thank you for being here this afternoon. We will now continue with a question for Jacqueline Thibault. You spoke about your, the 20 years you spent in the Middle East. Could you tell us a bit more? What countries did you work in? What groups did you work with? What did you do? And what did you learn in these regions? in terms of uh, honor killings. 20 years is a long time. I worked with a Swiss organization called Terre des Hommes. I took care of children, above all. And uh, pr we mount set up programs in Israel and Palestine, Palestinians. When you live in Israel, they are, in, they intermingle and when you work in the uh, ho hotel, in the hospitals, you see they live side by side. Now, I'd heard of honor killings, but it wasn't really in my m mission, and I didn't really come up against many young women. But one day, uh, somebody came up to me and said, there's a young woman who's been burned, and she's in a hospital right now. Perhaps we can do something to help her. So I went to see this girl in the hospital. I saw two women who had been burned in a huge room, and there were just two girls all alone. I didn't see any nurses coming in. And I went to see the, the doctor in charge, and I said, who are they? What can we do for them? I spoke about one above all, who seemed to me to, well, they were both dying, huh? But one seemed slightly better than the other, and I wondered if we could do anything. And he said, this is a family matter. Don't butt in. I said, OK, but I want to come back and see them. I was a humanitarian worker, and I felt worker. I felt I had was there for that. So I asked if I could do anything, if she could be given any care. She was very infected, she was pregnant, and she had given birth to her child, and she hadn't even felt the delivery because she was in such pain. And the child was put in an orphanage, and she wasn't allowed to keep the child because she was an unwed mother. So the fact that I went there, a young doctor saw me, And it was very difficult to see her. She couldn't be touched when she was put in a bath, for example. It was it was very hard to, to see this. It was very painful to see. I 
was able to get her changed, uh, get the hospital changed. And I asked for a visa for her to enter Switzerland. But the problem was what I said before. The parents. She was only 17. I had to meet with the parents, go and see them, talk to them. And they had to sign for a traveling document. And that's where you need to know the mentality, the mindset of the people of a country, how to express yourself and how to approach them. They ended up accepting the fact that I wanted to take their daughter. And, and, and two months later, she wasn't seeing her family anymore. She was in another hospital. But her mother had showed up with a glass of poison because she had heard that the daughter hadn't been killed from her wounds. So the doctor saw her and prevented her being given the poison and stopped the family coming from coming to see her. So she was given a, a laissez passer. We found her baby also. And she was able to leave with her baby and come to Switzerland, where she had 28 operations. She's living in Europe. She has, she's married. She has three children. I think she's well known. We wrote a book together, uh, like the book on, and the book for those, is is called Brûlé Vive in French, uh, Burned Alive. The book talks about the period that she was uh, set alight, but it explains the life she had from childhood, her life in her family, what she w was entitled to, what kind of treatment she received, the treatment of her brothers and her sisters. And some of them just disappear. We don't always know why, how the young girl has to work in the fields with her father. And so it's her story. I just have a little short question because we don't have much time. Is the, is the Foundation Surgia in Switzerland? And uh, do they, are there shelters? Do you work alone in dealing with people with these problems? Do you work with other countries? No, we said there are other countries, many countries that have the problem of honor killing. So we've organized ourselves to set up uh, uh, shelters and monitor and try and mediate with the families. We also said before that it's extremely important to train the police and social workers and health care workers, judges also. So everybody be aware of the problem and treat this differently. There's a difference between uh, ordinary crime and honorary honor killings, and we have to take preventive work. And that way, we hope we can avoid having honor killings. I'd like to thank you. Thank all of you.